Um, we're not quite sure how it happened, but basically at any point during the show, we mentioned the lamp. If you'd like to say, all hell the lamp, please do so. Um, we're in our own cult here. We certainly are. <laughs> A legal one. <laughs> don't know what you got yourself in for, Femi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody to the Sunday Roast and we're here once again with two fabulous guests or actually one co-host, one guest and no Max, but we do have a lava lamp to make up for it. Femi, could you please introduce yourself to everyone? Hi, my name is um, Femi Nylander. I am a filmmaker, an author, a musician, a poet and a general kind of artist um, with a political spin. Um, This is my book, which we'll talk about in relation to um, migration um, and the the refugee crisis we're going to, we're going to broach today, I believe, uh, Seeking Refuge 2060. Um, and I did a film a few years back called African Apocalypse on the French colonial invasion of Niger in West Africa, which is available on YouTube. Very, very good movie. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, is that the right way to describe that movie? Should you enjoy that movie, mm. Femi? It's a very uh, well-produced a... movie. That's what you can well, Thanks, co-host. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it should make you think. It should. You should come out of it um, feeling something. And I also saw another great movie yesterday, Yo Capitano, which I would recommend everyone to to watch. Also about the migrant uh, crisis. Um, yeah, I, I just saw it yesterday. Very, very, very interesting. Very, the same kind of thing. Should you enjoy it, or should you come out of it thinking, "I'm glad I watched that." That's a better term. I'm glad I watched that. Being a historian and everything. We'll come we'll we'll come on to being a historian shortly. Big Madge, could you introduce yourself, please? So I'm co-host for the day. Um I am not Max Robespierre. I am Big Match Studios. I run the Big Match Studio channel on uh YouTube. So um you can search me up there. Links in the description. I'm Alex, also known as Political X. I am a you the usual host of the show with Max, but obviously we don't have him, but we have a lava lamp and we have a great co-host and Femi. So that makes up for a lot. We're going to talk about France. Femi, your first topic. You you saw what was happening with the refugees trying to get across in the French boats and circling them and pepper spraying them. What are, your, what are your thoughts on all of that? So um, this is the interesting thing. When we talk about refugees, we talk about kind of the, the rhetoric of the small boats. Both France and the UK, the UK to a larger degree, of course, don't actually see the majority of traffic, even though they're largely, from a historical perspective, if you look at the relationships, the colonial relationships between European countries and the African continent, for example, I mean, Italy did dabble. It dabbled, didn't do very well, was chased out of Ethiopia, but it dabbled in the colonial um, adventure. Uh, Greece as well, not really, like France and England were the big daddies on the continent. Portugal had had its had its role, but France and England were the big daddies on the continent. But when you look at the fact that the kind of colonial invasion of Africa, the de-development of Africa, the continued neo-colonialism, which I broached in my film, African Apocalypse, between states like France and the UK and Africa, um, and then obviously, the, the conflict and the, um, the 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 climate change are pushing people to try and migrate from Africa to Europe. And you look at the states which are forced to, to, to bear this burden, and I do put burden in inverted commas, um, what you have is the Dublin Protocol. And the Dublin Protocol states that whichever country the um, refugee or migrant first arrives in, um, they have to stay in. Um, and so... They arrive at the ports of Italy and Greece and the idea within and this, of course, it then lends itself to the whole question of um, peripheral versus core European countries and the power relationship between them themselves. But countries like Italy and Greece bear the brunt of this so-called um, crisis and countries like the UK compared to a country like Italy or Greece barely are receiving any any, any refugees at their shores in the first place. So this whole scaremongering about 
the small boats this, small boats that, small boats this, small boats that, feeds itself into the the, the general scaremongering of xenophobia within the British um, sphere. And that's something which I which I broach in the book. And obviously, you have the, the 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 refugee from northern Nigeria who's making his way up through the Sahara, but you also have the kid, fifteen year old kid who plays video games all day because he's in a wheelchair um, and uses like the VR headsets and like sensor gloves. And because he's very good and has very fine motory processing, what do the Home Office do? They try and recruit him to control drones at the border to stop people getting in. To the country and obviously part of that is enforcer robots who are in calais and part of their job is to stop people getting across in the lorries and trucks and this that and the rest and and there's collusion with the french state for these enforcer robots to be allowed to um brutalize people at that at the border in calais and what we're seeing now is that and this is based in 2060 what we're seeing now is in real time that is becoming more and more a reality what we're seeing is the british government giving coin to the french state um to and we saw it with the, the calais jungle etc but we're seeing more and more and more the french as long as they receive a bit of cash from the british um actively going out into the waters encircling these small dinghies full of young desperate men um putting their lives at further risk um a lot of them unable to swim um risking i mean if you encircle these these small dinghies in order to kind of pressure them to go back you're, you're putting the boat at risk of capsizing um spraying people packed together in this small boat in, with, with pepper spray and it, it plays again to this question of because this is one of the tensions of british or the french aren't doing enough to stop the small boats and so it plays into this but it's like if we give them enough money then they'll they'll do our dirty work for us and it's it just goes to show that we have no real understanding in this country and again i would i, I, would, I would recommend everyone who wants to understand the, the the journey not only to read the book seeking refuge 2060 but to also watch a wonderful film that i watched last night called yo capitano which shows the journey that these young men faced um yo capitano in italian i o capitan and then the letter o um but yeah the reality is that it's becoming more and more and more brutal and fascistic and if you want to stop people coming to the uk and you want your little white haven of, or even your little British haven, because we know that Brexit Britain doesn't even want Polish people, um, <laughs> then what is the way to do that? The way to do that is to stop exploiting other people in other parts of the world, to redress the economic imbalances, which are a legacy of the British colonial and European colonial um, invasion of other parts of the planet, um, and to stop supporting um conflicts which involve little kids getting their legs blown off and forced into the Sinai desert because in a few years time of course there's going to be a lot of Palestinian refugees as well um, and when you do that people generally like to stay at home they like to stay where it's nice and hot where they have good weather where then it's not raining every Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday and where their parents sisters mothers brothers families languages cultures are they don't generally like to leave their home and try and cross the Sahara desert and the Mediterranean Sea there's almost an element of saying if you manage to do all of that and get here, God, you've got to have some good character about you. Like, also, there's obviously, you've be, like, you've obviously, you obviously always have the concern about we don't of not knowing who is coming in through the border, and you want to put in as many checks as possible. But at the end of the day, you're going. That is, it's a bit like imagine. I was thinking about it today, and like you've all read the Odyssey. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. It's, a Greek, it's the Iliad. It's the Iliad. It's the Odyssey. It's a great. It's a, it's it's it's, it's, an, it's a trek of kind of um, Grecian proportions. And this is the this is the ironic irony of it. Kind of a fifty year old pot bellied man um, sat in kind of gammon man sat in his on his sofa going, oh these scoundrels coming here to steal our resources and like the rest. It's like what have you done to be in this country? You plopped out of your mom in the UK and you're here, right? You 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 exist here. You've never you've not done anything to be here. These people have gone through an odyssey to be here. Who, who's more deserving? The person who has, has trekked across the desert, seen his friends die, um, seen risk dying in the Mediterranean Ocean, or the guy who was who was who was born here and who's had all the privileges of being a British citizen his whole life and who has no idea what these people have gone through. It it was something that came across my mind as well when I was thinking between the not age of zero to 18, the only tax you're paying is when your parents give you money. And I mean, there's obviously exceptions. There's exceptions to every rule. I try not to, to paint one brush, but between the age of, let's say not to 16 and mostly not to 18, you haven't really contributed anything to the economy. But someone coming over at the age of 18, immediately working, as long as they're legitimate, <laughs> uh, so they're paying tax, 
they're instantly contributing. It hasn't cost anything to the economy. I think I heard Milton Friedman, uh, US economist under Reagan, actually saying how great it is to have these people coming over. But he also, yeah. and it was really sinister and like next level capitalism. He was going, it's really good as well when they just get paid in cash because then we don't have to support them in any way. We don't have to give them medical facilities. Uh -huh. We don't have to give them police service and police protection. And we don't have to do anything else. And they have to go into hiding. Uh -huh. I mean, one of the biggest ironies, and I don't know so much about the UK. I've never looked at the stats. But in the US, if you look at the people that come over to the US, a lot of them don't want to be lawbreakers because as soon as they break the law, they'll be deported. So actually, uh -huh. if you look at that as a proportion, and I, I, I've never looked at the UK, so that's the only reason I'm not bringing it up. In the US... Uh -huh. I found that absolutely fascinating. Like they've got the stigmatism towards this group of people and actually they contribute mm -hmm. a lot towards tax. They haven't cost anything because if they're over the age of 18, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they've never been a burden on the state. And then on top of that, you've got the fact that they don't want to commit crime. And yet the antithesis that you see in the media uh, and the stereotyping and the language, I mean, this is, and Madge, I'm going to bring you in. Like, yeah. So what are Bravin's language? I'm I can literally cite where it is in Mein Kampf the words you use, and David Cameron. You know, I can, I can actually go and show you on this page, in Mein Kampf, he goes, migrants are vermin. They're pests. And it's the exact same language. And you have a Holocaust denier go up to her and say, please stop using that language. And she's like, nah, it's absolutely appropriate. I just, what? beggar's belief. Go on, Madge. Well, you, you got to think to yourself, like, if if you if they're not, you know, if you don't have a villain, you know, if we, if we realise, like, who, what what's the actual problem here? It's people in this country aren't paid well. So why is that? And they blame migrants for like a lack of resources. They say, oh, it costs this much to house them in hotels. Like, why don't you process the applications? It's like, oh, we don't want to encourage them to come here. It's like, you've catch 22 to yourself then. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So like in terms of like resources, it's the argument of, well, you know, I want to get paid more. Oh, why aren't you paid more? It's because of uh, freedom of movement. That's one of the arguments they use, right? When yeah. freedom of movement, I think only lowered wages by, I think it's like a percentage point or less. That That's the main problem we have here. It's just people mm -hmm. don't want to accept the fact that it's the state that screwed us. It's the yeah, state that screwed us. Yeah, and you, if, if you look at something like North Sea oil, like, why is that not nationalized? Why don't we have these kind of resources that other countries have done? You could nationalize it. You could refine the oil here. You could actually use it to produce a lot of jobs. Like, you know, it doesn't make sense. Do you know in Norway how much they, so when they give a contract out for the oil, do you know how much the government own of that contract? I think it's quite, it's like 70 odd percent or something like that. It's quite high, isn't it? Close. Femi, any idea? I don't, but I assume, knowing what I know about the Nordic states, that it was a lot more than a country like the UK or the US would. 50%. 50. Wow. And we're offering contracts right now for 17. So the state only mm -hmm. gets 17% of the total profit, basically, mm -hmm. which is nothing. And of course, no one's like, people are moving away from oil. But it just says something about, just to back up your point, Madge, yeah. it says something to just the attitude towards it. That's Interestingly, um, I've got friends who are Norwegian and I was talking to them about it and they were saying when in Norway, the way they look at the land, it's, it's sort of for everyone. It's not for a small mm -hmm. group, but you look at the UK history, it's completely the opposite. It's like, no, no, you earned it. So you get the right to have more control. It's almost like a meritocracy that's just gone a bit, not gone a bit. It's not even you earned it though. It's your it's great granddad. Well, your great, 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 great granddad was granted it by Henry VIII. Right. Yeah, he kicked a bunch of peasants off the land, and Henry's like, "This is yours, mate." Well, I mean, look at the monarchy. Like, yeah. the reason they're there is because they're good at killing English people. That is literally what William the Conqueror did. He turned up and he killed a load of people, and then his ancestors have inherited the throne. And you're going, "What's the principle there?" And I've I've said before in the program there is an old Norse law that says if I, if you want to, you can challenge the monarch. Homegang is a duel practiced by early medieval Scandinavians. It was a legally recognised way to settle disputes. So, I fancy a okay. chance against Charles. I, I do. I fancy your chances. He's not looking too good. He's never looked too good. So <laughs> I fancy your chances, Alex. If that's what you're saying. I didn't feel like I could do it. To the, I didn't feel like I could do it to the Queen. <laughs> she seems no, like I everyone's like grandma. But Charles. Yeah. I think. I mean, I mean, has anyone tweeted that he's had his ears pinned back as well? I realised no. that the other day. He's had plastic surgery. There's a picture oh, of. Really? Yeah, yeah co-op. Keep... He's not got anything done about his fingers yet, though. No, I don't think he ever will. He had those big Champions League ears, you know, the, the big, the big yeah. handles. <laughs> he can hear us. He can hear us. 
Yeah, sorry. Um, what, what, but yeah. what do you think? What do you think the solution is? We've gone, we've gone way off. What do you think the solution I, I think might you've be? Gotta, you've got to, you got to. Most refugees stay um, within the country or within the region. So it'd be about supporting those regions. Um, that would be the key thing. Like Pakistan, of saying they can't afford to house as many Afghan refugees as they are, even though we told Afghan refugees to come here and we would give them asylum. But now that's suddenly a problem. Um, so I think the the main thing is obviously stop destabilizing regions. That's the first thing. Uh, to do stop helping dictators and things like that open up safe points of entry that would be another key thing but also help the countries that are housing refugees now help those countries and people won't make the journey as much you know give them opportunities within those countries and that will help a lot because as i said pakistan has expelled a lot of afghan refugees where do you think they're going to go they are going to go to a neighboring country or they're going to try and come to europe so to avoid that, if we actually help them where they are, it helps a lot more to stop them making the journey here. And safe points of entry obviously make a lot of sense because, you know, for for Ukraine, they can apply online. Why can't Afghan refugees do that when we actually promise them refuge? That's a country we have a link with. We told them if the you know because we're essentially we've said you know we've allowed the Taliban to come back. It's a case of they could have applied online or via the embassy, or we could have set up a system for them to seek asylum here. We told them to come here. And now that they're here, the only way they can get is by crossing from France. And now we're demonizing those people, even though I think 90% of the asylum seekers from France have their asylum, um, have it uh, granted. So clearly yeah. the problem is how they get here. And we've made that system of how they get here. We could set yeah. up a processing center in France. I know Zoe Gardner was against that and she has reasons for that. Um, but there are other things we could do rather than the system we have Zoe now. Zoe Gardner is against... Uh, setting up the processing center in France. I think she was saying, like, if it's up to the French to govern it, we won't have any control over how people are treated and such. Um, and if you look at kind of how the French are treating kind of people crossing the channel now, I mean, they're purposely put, you know, create um, zooming past the boats to push water into the boats and cause mm -hmm. all sorts of issues. I'm not here to demonize the French, by the way. I'm just saying, like, it's what we I paid am. them to do. So <laughs> can we really trust? Can we really trust, you know, if the Tories set up a processing centre in France, it wouldn't be set up like that where it'd be a complete, you know, complete mess. Like we've seen what they've done here in this country with um, things like prisons, things like mental asylums, things like that, like that, the absolute horror show. So I can I can see her point. Like, at least if it's here, we can govern it a bit better. Mm. But given what we have here already is not great. I don't know about that. That was inter it's interesting you brought that up as well, because there was a story, there were so many little stories this week. There was the story about the prison guards being able to get in without any checks. Mm. I think yeah, they were going yeah. through a, um, a recruitment agency that basically just no CRB, no background check, just here's a job, go straight in, full Man. security access, and you're like... No DDS. That came out this week. There were so many little stories along those lines. I, I saw that. Like, I, I... I thought it was on um, LBC, wasn't it? I think it was Ferrari or someone like that was interviewing someone from, I think, The Telegraph. Okay. Um, and they just they just got in like, easy, light work. They just got into the prison. Um, anything could happen there. Like, And it does raise the question of who who is actually working in these prisons. Because they are desperate for prison staff because they won't pay enough. That's the problem. They won't pay prison staff enough because working in prison is dangerous. It's inherently dangerous. Um, and that's one of the problems we run into. We don't pay like government employees enough. And that you know, you, you create agency work like that, and you allow really unsafe things to happen. Point you made about um, the right to work and the fact that refugees often want to work is the create and the fact that they're criminalised. The craziest thing is these these kind of right wing pundits who say, "Well, refugees are all criminals," but at the same time, let's not allow them the right to work as a deterrent. And it's like, okay, so you're saying that they cannot work to deter them from coming to the country, but then you're saying that they're criminals, and it's like you're forcing them into the illicit economy. You're forcing them to deal weed because if you're here as an asylum seeker and you're getting ten quid, of whatever ridiculous, stupid amount of stupidly low amount of money it is from the government, um, and you're in a cockroach-infested apartment, what else are you going to do if you have no right to work apart from um, hustle a bit of green or something in the illicit economy? Because you have no right to work in the legal economy, and so they they complain that these people are criminals, but at the same time they advocate to not allow them the legal right. To work and it's, it's bonkers it's it's bonkers it is bonkers and it no, it doesn't seem they're ever satisfied so what you really come down to is what what they actually want which is just no one turning up yeah they just want it shut mm -hmm. and anything else in any other way is just wrong and unacceptable but then it comes on to that bigger picture who's been feeding them a lot of this stuff so we need it's interesting because labor just came out and said they want to build three hundred thousand houses a year Crisis say, 
uh, you need about 400 to 450,000 a year to be built. So even if they did manage to get the 300,000 built, you're not going to get it. But then it's, also it's not Labour building thing. them either. It's the private sector. Labour are going to allow more houses to be built on the Greenbelt. It won't be the government pushing like housing targets. It's going to be, they're saying the private sector will do it. Oh, wow. So they've actually gone that nuanced. That it's, yeah, it's so just it, the private it, sector. It's not social housing. Yeah, so it'll be, it'll be the private sector doing it. Like they, they, they won't do um, social housing. It's going to be, they're going to allow building on the Greenbelt to happen. Um, and they're going to, I don't think they're going to deregulate necessarily, but they're just going to allow, uh, allow more like plan permission to be easier, I think, um, in order to push through more houses. So this is an interesting segue. And it, I mean, it was interesting as well, because I was going to talk about housing and mental health. It was interesting because Nadine Dorries came out on this morning this week and said... And can I just bring it back to £3.2 billion when I was Mental Health Minister was given to mental health by Boris Johnson. It's, it was the same budget. It was actually a bigger budget than the entire prisons estate in the UK. So we spend more on mental health than we do on all of our prisoners and all of our prisons. As if that was some sort of justification. But there are only 90,000 people to 100,000 people in the prison system. There are 1.9 million people suffering from mental health. And we have all just quoted how the prison system looks like it's up the creek because the infrastructure hasn't been kept up. No one's looked after it. They haven't built new prisons. Um, prisoners are now put generally from what I've seen and read, instead of a room being for one person, it's now for two, which it wasn't designed for. And you're just going, and then you're making the comparison of 90,000 people to 1.9 million. You're making the comparison of 90,000 prisoners to 1.9 million people needing mental health support. And I know you, we, we want to talk about housing as well to, and to link that in. A lot of the problems that we're having are being caused by the government. And then they're just blaming minorities, the refugees, and anyone that they want to demonize in order to create a culture war. And it goes back to what we were saying about the CIA. We keep pumping information and pointing directions at other people, then no one's going to blame us for mm -hmm. our faults. And I thought that was quite quite an interesting thing, because, I mean, it seems to tie in with a lot of the problems that we're having, is that essentially we've had 14 years of total incompetence and really backward ideas, and then a lack of responsibility taking for having made those bad ideas. Femi, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the prison sector in the UK is... Another question, it's, it's, it, and it's, it's we know that it disproportionately locks up young black men, disproportionately locks up young men from, for example, a, a Pakistani or Bangladeshi background as well. It disproportionately criminalizes certain segments of society and puts them behind bars when money could be better spent on youth services, on um, on on initiatives, um, and also just like not criminalizing silly drug offenses that are on drugs that are not actually very harmful <laughs> right um so we know that the prison sector is not only kind of economically viewed it's also morally ethically um demographically um messed up in in so many ways um and it ties as well into um the migrant detention we spoke about migrants the migrant detention industry as well places like like yarlswood etc 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 and a lot of the same issues that you mentioned kind of guards not being vetted um abuse which which obviously, obviously leads to abuse of um of of, of inmates etc mirror themselves across both of those those scenarios um and I'd say it's more than 14 years of incompetence in my, in my own, in my own, from my own perspective. Um, but not just incompetence. I think the word incompetence um, sometimes takes away malicious intent. I can say someone is a buffoon. I could say Boris Johnson is an incompetent buffoon, but that mm. doesn't give justice to the fact that he's also a malicious actor who has it out for certain um, elements of society, certain minorities, certain groups. Um, I could say Jacob Rees-Mogg is incompetent, but <laughs> he's 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 malicious, and these people are are not just incompetent; they're malicious actors who are happy to criminalise certain groups, um, are happy to throw them in jail when they don't. And then this is the, this this goes back as well. There's an interesting book I think um, I think it's called How Schizophrenia Became Black, uh, a Black Disease, or something along those lines. Um, how Schizophrenia Became Black, and then it talks about how in America. Uh, schizophrenia originally was a disease for kind of the the it's like a kind of, you know like the whole oh my wife is this that and the rest of she's my kind of my my 
wife in the in 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 middle class America is 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 going through some some is mental issues, and so we're going to put the label schizophrenia on her, but and kind of this, that, and the rest of it. It's all very, it's all, it's it's a disease of 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 kind of middle class white women, and uh, it's not something which has a criminal aspect to it. And then schizophrenia starts to shift in the discourse and become this disease, which is linked to the idea of violent young black men who are schizophrenics, and therefore the diagnosis of schizophrenia becomes a lot more associated with the idea of criminality and the way that supposedly schizophrenic um, patients are treated becomes a lot more um, linked. I read this book years ago, so sorry for the very, very, very lukewarm, like kind of, in, kind of sorry for the very, very brief and um, and, uh, and um, uh, breezy um, synopsis, but please do go and go and, go and take a look at the book. Um, and again, so the, the idea of mental health and the idea of prisons are not just tangentially linked, they're, they're closely linked because when someone um, commits a crime, especially a violent crime, one of the main questions which comes up is, are they are they completely there? Are they sane? Are we talking about something which happened from a mental case or are we talking about something which happened because of this person um, was entirely malicious? Um, and this is something which itself lends itself to racial disparities. This is something which when we saw, and I actually knew this person. You remember, you remember when the um the the girl stabbed her her boyfriend, Lavinia Woodward, the Oxford grad, um stabbed her boyfriend. Yes, I do remember. I knew that. I, 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 I live on a boat in Oxford. Um, one of her other exes used to be another boater who lived near me. I met her. I knew I knew who she was. And I saw this thing of girl wow. stabs her her boyfriend. Um, and then the judge let her off because he said, well, this is a medical grad with with lots of potential um, and it would be a shame to put... And then you think, well, you, so you think about the rhetoric about knife crime in London, given all these kind of young boys who grow up on council estates and who have no opportunities and who are thrown into this world of kind of um, knives and this and the rest and sometimes carry them because they know other people have them and have, they might have to retaliate. And you think, of, you think of the approach to them and then you think of the approach to the Oxford medical student who's obviously never had any of that who stabs her boyfriend who gets let off and then you start to think about some of the parallels with mental the ideas of mental issues the ideas of mental health and how that language is used then it's, it's something which needs to be which needs to be looked at closely and it's something i need to do more research on because i've been deep in the world of migration as i've been writing this book and researching on migration and sometimes when i do that i leave other things at the door and don't don't research them as deeply as i should but it's definitely a, it's, 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 it's a it's a it's an area of 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 concern so that's interesting because i've just been listening to a uh, brain specialist called dr amen dr daniel amen the world's leading expert on the brain dr amen's mission is to end mental illness by creating a revolution in brain health and he's basically been talking about the structure of the brain and how it can be affected and one of the things can be trauma and the other thing that he pointed out is the problems of poverty and then one of the things that came up from that, from the problems of poverty is chronic stress, constantly in a stressful situation. So if you're in large levels of poverty, uh, deep levels of poverty, you know, worried about your next, you're living paycheck to paycheck, which a large number of Britons are now living through. That stress from the parents can go onto the kids, but it can also be experienced by the kids. And because your brain is in a constant state of stress of where you're gonna get your next meal from, it, it does affect I'm choosing my word, I'm trying to choose words carefully. It can damage and it will affect the brain. So, for example, um, one of the, the, the conversations he was suggesting for ADD and ADHD. What role does stress play on our brains? Stress, especially chronic, unremitting stress. So, if we think of the stress you had growing up, um, where there was a lot of fighting, it raises a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol begins to shrink activity in the hippocampus, one of the major memory and learning centers in the brain. So one could at least argue or postulate your struggle in school was because your emotional brain was busy because you were worried about things at home. It makes it more likely you get infections. It makes it more likely that you have learning problems. He brought about, and it comes back onto housing, he brought up how there was mold rats, mice in the house. And Dr. Amen claimed that with mold or other toxins, he didn't state many of which of what they were, he did state that that can also damage the brain and it can be in there for 
a substantial amount of time until you do something to get rid of it. He didn't go into too much detail of how you do that. But I was listening to it, and I was just going, if you look at the housing crisis, the social housing crisis that we have, if you look at the poverty that we're going through, social media, I haven't even touched on that, I'm going to leave that, but it is another cause of concern. You're going, no wonder all this stuff is going on. And I'll, I'll relay a story, and I'll pass it over to you, Madge. There was a clip on that went viral uh, of a young kid stabbing another kid on a train. And there were a group of people sat there who did nothing. And I sort of get why you wouldn't want to intervene. The knife was, I mean, it was huge. It looked like the width of my head, if not bigger. You, it's, you, even listen to like some top martial artists. They say, don't ever get involved in a fight. Always walk away. Because it could take one unlucky, lucky punch and you could be dead. And there's plenty of examples of that in court history. But coming kind of and trying to take someone on with a knife that big, you're going, that's crazy. And you sort of go, is society deliberately ignoring that? Are they immune to what's taking place within London? And I've taken that train route. That was another weird thing. That could have been me on that train. I don't know what I would have done if I was in that situation. I literally have no clue because it was such a big knife. Um, there was another situation that happened this week. I was walking to the gym at about 7.30 in the morning. And there's this guy splayed out on the pavement next to a bus stop. And his head is face down. And I'm walking up to him going, that doesn't look like a homeless person. Most homeless people would be curled up at least blanket first thing in the morning under some sort of shelter. This guy's like right face out on the pavement. I came and I came close. So I was like, looks like he's got work clothes. He's got a backpack on. It looks like he's either just coming from work or he's about to go. I looked at his haircut and it was all clean cut. There are eight people at the bus stop and they're all glued to their phones. And I'm going, what? the hell and I, I go down to him and i'm like hey are you okay and he's sort of he's a bit co coherent but incoherent he doesn't smell of alcohol he doesn't have that homeless smell um so i'm going this looks like a guy that could have passed out and i go i'm just gonna get you some water are you okay he's like i'm okay i'm okay go off come back and i look around and everyone's still glued to their phones no one's done anything and i let loose into the crowd i said has anyone called an ambulance nope nope no one's called anything and I just rip into them, absolutely verbally rip into them, going, what is wrong with you? I use far worse language than that. And it was almost like they took their eyes away from the phone and suddenly twigged what was going on. I don't know how else to explain it. Anyway, the, the ambulance turned up within about 15 minutes, but it was just shocking to see that level of disconnect. And it goes back to what we were saying with the mental health stuff, the poverty stuff, the social media stuff, the acts of uh, violence that seem to be taking place within London that people have now become so disconnected from, they don't want to get involved. And it was interesting as well, because there was, I'm not going to name too much, but there were students there. I rang up the school of those students and basically they said a lot of their students have been told not, like, have got it into their head to not get involved because they're so concerned about knife crime, but also a number of them have said that they're, they're, they're concerned about getting involved because if they call up the police, they're concerned they'll end up being the ones getting in trouble, even though they haven't done anything wrong and they try to do a good deed. It was really shocking, and I promise I'll end, Madge. Sorry, I've gone on a long yeah, one, no, here, but it was it, it really blew my mind that people could like for all they knew, that guy could have been dead, and they were just sauntering around as if nothing was going on. Like he might as well have been invisible. I thought that. That was really interesting to see in terms of what's happening in the UK and essentially a longer term problem that we're going to be building and dealing with in about 10 years because of Tory behaviour. And we can we can bring in Labour. We can talk about, you know, lack of social housing developed by Labour. Happy to point blame, you know, when I see it and point good stuff when I see it. Madge, go on, your thoughts. Yeah, th there's a lot there. I think with the um, with the mould and stuff in the so social housing, I think that's a product of... Um, allowing a lot of dodgy landlords buy to let mentality of they're going to maximize the amount they can make from the house. Um, councils have had their budgets cut dramatically. So um, they can't, the councils are meant to be the ones that enforce um, stuff on houses where, like, if there's mold in the house that you rent, the councils can enforce change. But because they've been 
they've cut the budgets of those areas so much they don't they either don't have the staff to do it or they haven't allocated it um that kind of goes further to um social housing as well um social care as well where the council have cut massive amounts of budgets from childcare. so um kids that do have problems there's no one really looking out for them um social workers are completely overrun um and um with the knife crime like with that story you gave out it's absolutely wild that that man could have been dead and no one would have known potentially for days because no one would have bothered to check on him until they saw flies or something like that's that's wild but um i think in England, there is just so much like apathy and just no care like with, with the knife stuff as well like yeah it's best not to get involved in that kind of stuff because it's just it's so normalized it's so normalized county lines we know about all this stuff people know about like drug trafficking it got so bad to the point where people were buy- blaming the drug buyers um a year or two ago they were saying well shouldn't we look at the middle class people who are buying the drugs because where there's where there's demand there's supply and in terms of the knife crime like ironically Jermaine Janus who's like yeah kind of boring when it comes to football he did a really good few documentaries the first time I was stopped I was 17 16 years old the first time I was stopped by the police about 15 years old I was 14 years old maybe 13 age 13 13 years old I was 12 years old maybe 8 or 9 7 or 8 um I was in year 4 he did a really good few documentaries on knife crime in I think he's from Nottingham and there's a kid who had like a knife about that long Kind of that wide. I think they call them ZKs, zombie killers. That's that's the yeah, name for it. Machetes, yeah. that kind mm. of stuff. Um, and he was just, yeah, he was like, yeah, I carry it around because if I don't carry it, um, the next guy will stab me or something like that. And he kind of asked him, what happened to just having a street fight? You just fight and then that's it. You know, worst thing that happens, you get like a, a black eye or like, you know, a broken orbit or something like that. He goes, nice change. I have to carry this because if I don't carry it, the next guy's going to stab me. And you see videos of it as well. Where people try and like, they just attack each other in those random places like um, takeaways and stuff. And, um, you know, just two guys with like knives drawn. So, um, on each other and neither guy wants to make a move because they, they know they could die so they back out but if one of them didn't have the knife the other one's killing them like that's it and so it's just gotten so bad where the police just haven't enforced anything haven't they either haven't got the resources they don't care enough to deal with this kind of stuff and it's become people become so kind of apathetic it's just normal it's normal like they make jokes about us everywhere around the world like knife crime's bad in england like that that's how bad it is it's a worldwide known thing um I it's interesting guy, what- yeah God, I, I was just saying, I, I, def, I wouldn't say all police are like that. I'm, I know police not, not all, but I think, I think with the police being so underfunded, like they have to allocate mm-hmm. resources where they can, and I think they just they don't they either don't have it or some of them don't want to deal with it. That's the problem. Yeah, no, I was going to say as well the point you make about um the some of the blame being on consumers is is that's 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 something which has also been brought up on an international level. Yeah. Um, when you look at like your your coke sniffing um banker in the city. Uh, it's like okay, well, do you know what has happening in Colombia? Do you know what has happened in Colombia? Do you know what 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 goes on with the cartels, and 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 the amount of violence which exists in Latin America to fund your 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 habit? Uh, a lot of them don't. A lot of them don't care, right? But it's it's it's, it's always been a question with 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 the consumption of certain drugs, and it's also been a question. I mean, coke is a very different matter, but like with marijuana, for example, it's always been a question of okay, well. What are you doing? What's the government doing? It's, it's, it's turning this into an illicit product. Marijuana is significantly less harmful to society than tobacco. It doesn't alcohol give people well. cancer. Yeah, and alcohol, right? Both of those are legal. Marijuana is not legal, which then forms this illicit market, which then spawns a scene where crime can and will um, pro- proliferate. And if, 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 if alcohol was, <laughs> right, if marijuana was, was legal, then you wouldn't yeah. see knife crime around 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 marijuana, deep, would you? Um, and yet you're happy for alcohol to be legal, which is which which causes people kidney failure, and you're happy to and which causes drunk driving and this that, and the rest. You're happy for have, tobacco have, to be legal. Have you seen the Tom Holland clip where he talks about alcohol? It wasn't a thing, and you like I've invented this drink that is gonna make you like either really happy or really aggressive or really stupid, and we're gonna just sell it to the masses. People will be like, "Nah, mate, keep your <laughs> funky juice. Like we don't want that. That sounds yeah. terrible." And it's one of those things, because it is so socially acceptable, the, the addiction side of it, the bad sides of it, really do fly under the radar. You can tell, I think he had a problem with it. Um, and that, that's what it is. Like, it's dangerous um, because people can't control themselves. That, that's it. That's the reason why certain drugs are banned. Like, at least with weed, like, you know, it doesn't impact productivity that much, despite what people have said about it. In Colorado, like, it's absolutely booming, you know, the amount of money they're making through um, it being taxed. And that could go back into NHS, back into you know mental health services to deal with the byproducts of it, you know the side effects of it. But it's just it's just it's just madness. Like 
like that one's not, and a hard it's not one addictive to deal with. in the same it's not bodily yeah. addictive in the same way as tobacco so for example with tobacco the argument you just made um a lot of people will say oh well you can take the argument of 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 like a of, of taking tax funds from tobacco and then putting it into anti tobacco um things but the thing is tobacco is an addictive drug and therefore it's yeah. is 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 in, in economic terms that means that it's um elastic in inelastic sorry inelastic which means that um or price inelastic meaning if the price goes up people will still buy it because they they, they need it we doesn't like that if a lot of people if they smoke weed and suddenly the price is not is, is, is higher they'll stop smoking weed because their body yes maybe they have a habit but their body isn't telling them you need your next hit you need your next hit in the same way as it does with both alcohol and tobacco it's not addictive in the same way i mean it is addictive it is addictive mentally but, but not chemically is that correct yeah like physically yeah exactly it's not got that kind of the bodily withdrawal effects that like the like you kind of you're sweating at like it was alcohol if you're an alcoholic and you don't drink, then you'll feel bodily effects of sweating. Well, anyone, anyone knows what alcohol withdrawal is. Um, tobacco as well, right? You get your high heart rate, you get your this, that, and the rest. Whereas um, weed is can be mentally addictive. It, you can kind of be mentally addicted to it, but it's not. Um, yeah, it's not got those those withdrawal effects. That's my understanding. It can also, I mean, it's kind of a psychosis as well, which is obviously a concern. Which is why you know, if we were going to go down, it's interesting because I was thinking about this with. Uh, with with the refugee crisis in France, one of the ways to get rid of them, and you can see this historically, there was a I think it was William Pitt the Younger, yeah, it was Pitt the Younger, sorry, who had a problem with tea smuggling, so they just reduced the tax, and then the tea smuggling stopped. <laughs> that that was it, and it, it, it's interesting again, like we come onto this sort of business argument. You can see that the government doesn't work on business lines, even though most of them claim they're good at business, they don't think about things economically. So when it comes to the refugees, you've got this element of going, well, if you if you had points of entry, whether in France or the UK, and we can debate on that, it then cuts out their, their ability to make money. So they stop doing it. it should, in terms um, of color. It, I'm not saying it'll cut it out completely, but it should reduce it. And it's the same argument that you could have with cannabis. By legalizing it, you can tax it, which means that you've got more money for mental health. I think it was in, you brought up Colorado. I think the mayor or the governor, I think it was governor of Colorado, said he hated, he hates marijuana, but he was really happy that it was legalized because they were making so much money, yeah. which is just, it's like, wow. I mean- Well, on the refugee side, they're, they're thinking in terms of color. If you asked, if you asked your kind of average GB news gammon, um, you could double the UK's GDP tomorrow but 50% of the UK would be B-A-M-E, black minority. I think they say, no, let's keep the GDP where it is because they're not thinking in terms of economics. They're thinking in terms of colour. They're thinking in terms of this, this mythical idea of a white, white Britain um, that managed to colonise the world, but it's not going to have anyone from anywhere else in the world come to British shores. Do you, do you remember that pub that put up those racist dolls, the Gollywog ones? And then they got all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. and got told to take it down, right? They said, you know, in the end, they moved to Turkey and they were mad at foreigners. And you're like, the irony of this, like the actual irony that you've moved to a foreign country and you're mad about foreigners or the mm. ones in Spain that get angry because there's too many foreigners. I'm like, dude, like, where do you think you are? Right. Are like, you in Britain? It's, it's honestly, it's wild. Like the mentality, like the entitlement, like that's what we saw kind of in 2016 of, oh, you know, they're not going to, they're going to stop the proper Europeans. It's literally what a guy said. He lived in Spain. He benefited from freedom of movement. He goes, oh, you know, Brexit screwed me now, even though I voted for it, because I didn't think they would stop freedom of movement for the proper Europeans. I'm like... But Dave, who bought his Spanish holiday home after voting to leave, no longer wants to. What's, what's the biggest thing you think you've learned that swayed you? Well, the freedom of movement uh, in Europe, you know, the, for, for the, the proper European... To so you want to keep your own freedom of movement? Mm so that you can come back and forth between here and the UK? Yes, I know it might be selfish, but I think on reflection now, we'd probably vote for, uh, if we had a referendum, probably on, um, the other way now. Vote to remain now? To remain, I think uh, you might have shot yourself in the foot a little bit. Might have done, yes. Very well have done. There's no hierarchy, dude. Like, not really. Like, what, what makes you better than someone else who's in an EU member state? It doesn't make sense. Well, if you look at the history of the EU, the EU originally started with few Nordic countries and then a few kind of central um, kind of core states and then eventually it expanded to what are called the peripheral countries, Italy, Greece and, this and the rest. And then after that, it expands again and accepts kind of like some of the Eastern European countries, um, Poland this and the rest. So this idea of the proper Europeans actually does kind of fall into some British mentality. Some British people will be like, oh, we don't mind Spanish people, we don't mind French people. But when you get to those Poles, or when you get to those 
those those Eastern Europeans. And so that itself kind of falls into its own, own history. When you look at the, the German German fascism, um, which has its parallels with British fascism, um, the Slavs, the Eastern Europeans were seen as 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 as, as lower um beings, as this, that, and the rest. And 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 some of that the whole Brexit thing, because Brexit, I mean, I know a lot of British people got confused and thought when Brexit happens, we're going to stop all the Browns. But Brexit was like the actual Brexit's about freedom movement within Europe. <laughs> so we're talking about largely we're talking about different types of white people. <laughs> and they were still like, we don't I, want, I'm gonna, don't want I'm, anyone. I'm going to play a bit of devil's advocate. but I'll say that, you know, I could imagine a number of people that voted for Brexit were also thinking, oh, we get money for the NHS. We get money for other other areas that we need well, some of them fell for the, the eu doesn't seem to be benefiting people and i'd say like there was an example in wales where there was a group of people again old people uh outside i can't remember the name of the town but they had this statue built by the eu which was a dragon they had a community center built but they were like we don't want that we want industry and it was almost as if they they couldn't see the disconnect it's like the eu have given you something whether you like that or not, they've given you something. The industry problem is nothing to do with the EU. It's to do with how the markets work. You can't necessarily compete with other countries that can produce the products that you want, let's say steel, at a cheaper price in larger quantities. You're never going to be able to do that. So I think there was definitely an element within that where people were convinced of something to be true. And this then comes back to the media being an issue that clearly mm -hmm. wasn't. But there was an element of logic to it. Because if they look around their town centre, they're going, oh, the EU's just given us a freaking dragon. What, the, what, what are we meant to do with the dragon? But you're also going, that's not the responsibility of the EU to get industry up and running. That's the UK government who then just... That was Thatcher and Blair who did that, really. Yeah. yeah that, was, that, that was those two who really did yeah. that. So, like, yeah, it's just people... Like I said, it's just deflection. People are mad at the wrong groups of people. That's the main problem we have in this country. Like, you can get mad at refugees, mad at migrants and stuff. But is that at the end of the day, uh, is that going to change anything? No, you've got to get mad at the government because they're the ones that cause a lot of the problems. 90% of the problems will be caused by them. If you look at the, the genetic difference within within humans, it's 0.4%, which means that we probably bottlenecked, anthropologists think that we bottleneck to about, I think I've read anywhere between 40 and 1,000 people at one stage. So we're all essentially cousins and related to one another. And yet you've got this group that have come up with this crazy notion it's almost like a religion. It's it, of of thought that makes zero sense when you look at it based on scientific fact. Is it as high as zero point four percent? Because I thought we shared like ninety eight percent of our DNA with like chimpanzees. I mean, I might be wrong, but I mean, no, no it's zero point four percent differentiation in the genetic structure of humans. Okay. Chimpanzees are one point four percent genetic variation. So we that's why we think that we had a bottleneck of. Yeah, forty to a thousand people at one stage. We we, we can discuss as to why that happened. Fair, another fair, fair, fair. No, but makes the point sense. is, the like, actually, we've got a lot of commonality. Yeah. We haven't got much genetic differentiation, and yet you've got groups of humans exactly. thinking they're all superior and that they're all significantly different. And actually, we've got a lot of commonality. We've got more com yeah, more in common than we have in difference. Again, so if we look within, and this is why you get the whole um, weird kind of legs it is because if you look within the eu and you look at the eu as an institution so for example if you look at the common agricultural policy there are valid criticisms of the eu when you look at the eu as yeah. europe relationship with the rest of the world so you say okay look at the common agricultural policy look at the fact that the eu is happily subsidizing its farmers whilst telling developing nations you have to completely go free market free market free market you can't do any kind of protectionist policies but we'll do protectionist policies but is britain more left-wing <laughs> than the rest of europe no. And is Britain, if you when you compare, and this is the thing, you have these relationships with countries like Germany, countries like Britain, um, countries like France, a lot of the core European countries, the same, um, the same attitudes they have towards peripheral European countries and Eastern European countries govern the way they think about things like the Eurozone crisis, govern the way they think about the, the way that um, Greece was um, treated after the 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 2008 financial crisis, this, that, and the rest. And it, like that's why, I mean, for years and years and years, British racism and kind of European racism to the rest of the world has allowed, for example, the structural adjustment loans um, that basically meant that countries formerly colonized by Europe then had to pay back loans and then interest on those loans and attached to those loans are conditions of 
financial privatization, um, currency liberalization, stuff which is going to ruin your economy, I mean, you have to gut your healthcare sector, this, that, and the rest. The reason that the same thing, well, part of the reason, a small part of the reason that the same thing was then allowed to just happen to the Greeks was because of the fact that you have this idea that, well, we're British in there. Right. Or and and so it's you, you have it's it's weird sometimes to say and that's that's of course not an argument for Lexit because Britain is, is further to the right than most European countries. Um but um and so, so the idea that we're gonna leave and suddenly become this haven of progressivism is 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 a joke. But um I feel as okay. if with the under twenty five generation that's gonna happen. Yeah. I think that like that I, think that looks, I mean shift. like the Tories have shut down the young conservatives because no one will sign up. There's literally clips of kids in the Tory party turning up and going, I've got no friends because I vote Tory. And you're going, and, 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 and Gemma Forte, who's been on, has said she is aware that on the dating apps, there was people writing no Tories. <laughs> but this like, is the thing. Oh, the the problem one. is mm. the Tories are kind of slowly becoming UKIP. And with Starmer yeah. at the moment, it seems like the Labour is slowly kind of trying to morph itself in some ways closer to, 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 to the Tories or, or model itself on, on some elements of that. And so if the whole UK, but then that's the, I do think that the younger generation in general is more disillusioned in general with neoliberal politics, more disillusioned in general with these policies. And any party which then decides they're going to dress up on that and, 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 and play into xenophobia, play into like, like support genocide um, and, um, and um, give neoliberal politics is going to find itself having a tough a tougher time with the younger generation i feel like there is there's a definitely a shift to the left amongst young people in the country not just under 25s also people of my age group which is a good thing i don't know if this is a european wide thing because i have heard that in france for example young people a lot of the time are very far right <laughs> but within the uk um i think you you have you have a fair point there so within within a historical perspective generally in a recession, people go to the extremes because they're going, oh, the main parties aren't working. But I've never seen any numbers higher than 30%, not until the dictator gets in and then starts changing all the laws and then making everyone follow them. I think Putin might be the exception because he's done it somewhat subtly. It was quite, uh, I'm not going to segue into, into, into Putin and, and how he's done it. But generally, yeah, it's about 30%. So if you've got a decent dem democratic system, it'll never get higher than that. And therefore, in theory, they shouldn't be able to get into power. Or if they do, they have to have a coalition. Um, so there's there's a bit of hope. But yeah, generally, it has been going up and the youth have been following. So like Marie Le Pen seems to have a youth following. Uh, disturbingly, um, I also heard uh, in Italy, there's a, a youth growth movement towards the right. Um, Mussolini's tomb still exists and people can visit it. Sounds like Voulet. Yeah, he got he got a gnarly death. To be fair, he he um yeah he's uh, no no dictator wants to die like Mussolini did. That's the big fear a lot of them have. It's like yeah mm -hmm. no um with, with the with the um with younger people in certain countries turning to the right. So I think Le Pen, these people, it's the populists, the ones that say, oh, you guys do have problems, but these are the reasons you have problems, and they'll normally point out like migrants or something like that. That's the reason they have so much youth support because when you look at the problems we have in this country, they're similar to. Um, other things that they have in other European countries, like uh, probably low youth unemployment, low wages, lack of housing, a lack of opportunities. So if you have someone like um, Le Pen saying, oh, the reason you can't have houses is because of um, migrants and stuff like that, that appeals to a certain group of people who won't know better. That's the reason why, like, you know, in this country, we've had it for a long time, but you're with UKIP and stuff, but with younger people, I don't think they buy it in this country as much because they know that's not true. Like... It, it comes back onto that mental health stuff. Are they being encouraged to learn more about empathy and caring for others within within the classroom? Has that been a good thing? Has Labour's period of economic stability brought this generation through, which have less issue? Social media is the biggest change. And I wonder how much of an effect that's had. But I would have that's thought social effect. media would have made people yeah. less empathetic. Go on, well, I mean, the, look at look at look at what's going on right now. Back back in Libya, um, even when what was happening in Libya with any kind of previous. Assault. Uh, we we'll go back to the Bengal famine. The Bengal famine of 1943, one of the deadliest famines in modern history, was a humanitarian catastrophe that ravaged the Bengal region of British India. The requisitioning of food was primarily aimed at building reserves for other parts of the world, including Europe. This policy, however, resulted in severe consequences for the people of Bengal. 
exacerbating the famine conditions and leading to loss of life of millions. The decision to prioritise food reserves for other regions over the immediate needs of the affected population in Bengal has been widely criticised as a contributing factor to the scale of suffering and death during the famine. In the time of the Bengal famine, you weren't seeing live streamed images of of, of, of kids um, on their deathbed with 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 like their hollow cheeks and this that and the rest. Youth today are saying this is why they're trying to ban TikTok, <laughs> right? Because yeah. they don't control the narrative on it. Um, youth today are seeing what is happening in real time, and it's very difficult. Like, how many young people watch CNN? How many young people watch BBC? How many young people watch GB News? Right, Not very right. They're they're watching mm-hmm. their phones. And they're seeing a genocide happen in real time at the moment and so and not just that they're seeing the rest of it so and and they're also seeing it a couple of years after they were told ukraine 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 right and it's and so they're, they're seeing the double standards of of what happens when putin has his invasion and then what happens when we have our invasion um and so i think yeah young people are not buying it largely because of social media and because of the fact that they see in real time the the reality Nice. Yeah, I was gonna say the other thing TikTok does is because it's mostly like people doing it. It's not like it's not just famous people. It's like the average person they just put videos up, and you know they say, "Oh, you know, I've got all of these problems," and then other people say, "Oh, I've got all these problems as well. They're the same problems." So you realize, oh, it's not you who's a failure; it's a system problem. So I think Grace Blakely spoke quite recently, where it's like people can kind of connect with each other and see like it's a system problem rather than an individual problem. Like if this was like you know, pre, you know, just before the internet, kind of 10, 15 years ago, if you if you weren't doing well in life, you might think, oh, I'm a failure. But now, when you say, oh, I can't buy a house, uh, my job doesn't pay well, and someone else might say, yeah, you know, I, I don't make that much money either. You know, I can't buy a house, and yet so many people saying it. It's like, well, it's not just me. Clearly, there's a bigger problem. That's that's how it goes because it's very easy to kind of internalize failure when you do it on your own. But yeah. whereas when, when so many other people saying I have the exact same circumstances, even though, you know, we're both working you know, 30, 40 hours a week, there's something wrong here. That's that's really interesting. You brought that up because I ran the numbers on. So it, generally in a capitalist society, you have to have an increase in population to support the elderly. You have to. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that. I think Holland, but generally you need to be do, replacing by about 2.1. So every family needs about. 2.1 kids in theory we're having 1.56 and we're also losing 600,000 people a year because they're emigrating they're going to australia they're going to new zealand they're going to the eu they're going to the us they're going to canada they're leaving 600,000 if you look back in the 70s i think it was either 10 or 60,000 a year so we've 10 times the number leaving and that was considered a brain drain back then with just 10% of what we're suffering with now but if you include the number of the birth rate the only way economically you can fix that is to have immigration and we know this because if you go and look Uh at japan under abby when he was in charge he did a lot of socialist policies but they didn't and they increased gdp per person what Uh they didn't do is fix the economy because it was still shrinking Japan has its own kind of hyper-nationalistic history. Yeah. Um, I mean, you look mm. at World War, Japan yeah. has its own current kind of xenophobia where they just want yeah. Japanese people. And so they've got this weird rhetoric where they're like, look at all these old people, look at our ridiculously old aging population. Let's figure a way to get robots to be our carers rather than just let migrants in to look after our old people. It's like, we know you've got great robot companies. We know your world leaders in robotics, but just let in some brown people and you'll be fine. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up on this question. Do you think in Japan they sell more diapers for babies or for seniors? F*** it now. Oops. Seniors? You think yeah, I'll seniors, go seniors. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go seniors as well. Correct. Correct. They sell more diapers to seniors than they do babies. That's wild. That's wild. That's, that's a wild, wild. Fact. On yeah. that note, bye everyone. See you. See you later. Hail the lamp. Bye, Max. Next week for another exciting story from the files of Police Squad.